Okay, now I will introduce to you our speaker for today, Pastor Eugene Xiao. Okay, Pastor Eugene is the husband of one wife, Julie, father of three adult children and two daughters-in-law, and grand, uh, a proud grandfather of four. Right, he was a practicing architect for 10 years before responding to his life's call to serve the needy and the disadvantaged in the community. After nearly 30 years of leadership in the social service sector and the local church, Eugene, Pastor Eugene has moved forward into a new season of coaching, mentoring, and walking with the next-gen leaders to remember the poor. So Pastor Eugene and Julie in this season worship at Living Sanctuary Brethren Church. Let us welcome Pastor Eugene to the stage. Thank you, Hi, a very good morning. So good to see each and every one of you here. You know, I'm really, really thankful and honoured by uh, Pastor Jeff and Claudia's invitation to come and Pastor Daniel for just inviting me here. Uh, I really, my wife and myself, Julie, just are so excited always to be able to come and visit with you all. And, uh, you know, I think it's more often than we, we, we think, okay, <laughs> right? But we do catch up a lot, and, and also, so it really is so nice to see each and every one of you here. Uh, thank you again for inviting me. Um, um, let's, let's, let's pray first, okay? Let's pray. Father, we're going to thank you for this time, and we are just so awed by your presence. And we know that you are here. We bless you, Lord. We ask that, Lord, you take every need in our heart, every concern in our spirit. Lord, we want to submit it into your precious hand. Father, we believe that you are here to teach us, you're here to guide us, you're here to love us, Lord, in a very unique and special way, in our own generation. So, Lord, we bless you. I ask that, Lord, the words from my mouth and the meditations of my heart, Lord, be truly acceptable before you. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen, amen, amen. My slides up. Um, up. <laughs> okay, yeah. First, I want to just say hi to you, okay? And, yep, <laughs> okay. Uh, first, I want to make a confession. I want to declare first that I'm 67 years old, okay? So I'm allowed to be here in this service, right? I am also Medeca generation, okay, right? And then I take. MRT on a senior's card, okay, all right, okay, so, so, so I'm, I'm here with you, okay, I'm, I'm, re I'm really here, I'm at the right service, and, and, and I, I just am so excited that, that, that God has allowed us this privilege to be in this generation to really thank God, okay. Uh, in fact, uh, just a few weeks ago, I'm sure you know that there's a new job opportunity that's always available for us above 60, you know, and that's called the President of Singapore, okay? <laughs> All right? Okay, but anyway, uh, that's something we can think of in about another three or six years' time, right? But anyway, think about that, okay? Think about that, right? I'd like to open with an interesting story, okay? And let me tell you a story about one day about a fisherman who was lying on a beautiful beach with his fishing pole propped up in the sand. And his one fishing line cast out into the deep blue sea, okay? And he was hoping to catch that one fish. As he was enjoying the warmth of the afternoon sun and, and they're just waiting, about that same time, a businessman, okay, came walking down the beach. And he was trying to relieve from some of the stresses from his work day. And he noticed this fisherman, okay, that was sitting down by the beach. And he decided to find out why this fisherman was doing that instead of working harder, making a living for himself and his family. So he turned, went to the fisherman and he says, you aren't going to catch many fish that way, said the businessman to the fisherman. You should be working rather than lying on a beach. Then the fisherman looked up at the businessman and smiled and replied, And what will my reward be? Well, you can get a bigger net and catch more fish, said the businessman's answer. And then, what will my reward be? Asked the fisherman again, still smiling. And then the businessman right? You will make more money. You'll be able to buy a boat, which will then will result in larger catches of fish. Then the fisherman smiled again and says, And then, what will my reward be? 
By this time, the fisher, businessman was getting a little bit irritated okay, with the fisherman's question. You can buy a bigger boat, hire some people to work for you. And then, what will my reward be? The fisherman replied. Now, this time, the businessman was really, really angry. Now, you don't understand. You can build a fleet of fishing boats, sail all over the world, and let all your employees catch the fish for you. And once again, the fisherman smiled and said, and then, what will my reward be? By this time, the businessman was really red with rage, and he shouted at the fisherman and said, don't you understand that you can be so rich that you will never have to work for the living again? You will spend the rest of your days sitting on this beach, looking at the sunset. You won't have a care in the world. Then the fisherman, still smiling, looked up and said, and what do you think I'm doing right now? Well, is this the ultimate price of retirement? Sitting by the beach, cool drink in hand, is that what success would look like? As somebody once said, is retirement every day a Sunday, every day a holiday? Well, I'm sure many of you know that the answer is neither the beach nor the non-stop working treadmill, okay? And I call this what I call the retirement dilemma. We feel guilty keeping on working, and we even feel more guilty, right? Stop working. And we, and we even feel more guilty, uh, 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 stop working. But the sad thing is this, you know, many of us here may not even have a choice. And many of us feel trapped and cornered and trying to keep on working. And on the other side, some of us had to stop work. No work given. The feeling of being unwanted, abandoned, and sometimes even shame. Is this our reward? And I'm sure this is happening not just to the world out there. It can happen to many of us, even in here. So just a few years back, when I came into this season myself, the Lord gave me a picture, actually. The Lord gave me a picture to appreciate and understand what this balance and balancing is all about. If you look at the screen here, it was a little sketch that I was sketching one day, trying to understand between rest and work. And then I begin to realize that it all pivots around this key thing right in the center called your sense of calling and your sense of purpose. Actually, after I drew this sketch, then I knew somehow what I was describing was Romans 8, 28. And we know that in all things, God works for good for those of us who love Him and who are called according to His purpose. You know, all things will work out for good when you have these two conditions in mind. We love God and we are called according to His purpose. And then I happened to pick up a book by a brother, uh, uh, a Christian brother in Singapore who wrote a new book called Beyond Work. And in that book, he had one chapter about those of us in this season of life, and he calls it the autumn season, okay? And he says this, balance looks different to everyone. The right balance comes when we are rested in God, deeply assured in what He calls us to do in the autumn years, and find joy in living the season purposefully. You see, when I got this picture, I begin to realize that it's not about whether you have more rest or you have more work. What balances it all up is actually your sense of purpose and your sense of calling. But at the center of it all, if you notice, there's this red spot right in the center of it all. It's actually our relationship and our intimacy with the Lord. And out of that intimacy, out of that call, the call and the purpose will balance this. So sometimes some of us may be, in, even in this season, more restful, right? But actually, when you are in the purpose of God, you actually come back up again. Some of us may be working more, right? But if you are doing it in the purposes of God and the calling that God has given to you, we are actually back into balance. That's why I personally don't like just the word balance. I prefer the word balancing. Because you see, in our journey, it's not one or the other. As we walk, there are times where we have to do this 
There are times where we have to do that. And it is in this season that I believe the freedom that God has given to us to do what He has called us. That's why for me, the measure of so-called success, the measure of what God wants us to be is really found in Acts 13 verse 36, where David was recorded to say, when David had served God's purposes in his own generation, he fell asleep. To me, that's the gold standard. The gold standard is that when you and I, in whatever generation, I know this message can be preached to the young man and old man, but in particular to us in our generation, okay? In our generation, right? If we fulfill God's purposes, that is the gold standard. And that's what we're here for. That's what we're here for. You see, when you start living a life fulfilled in God's purposes, I'm not going to judge you whether it's because you rest more or you fish more, okay? Right? right? Or, or, or you work more. The issue is, are you in the purpose of God? The calling that God has for your life. And if you are in that place, right, there is something unique and common. You see, there's a growing concern. I'm sure many of you know that we have a generation growing older and a growing problem coming sooner. Many of you have probably seen this report before, a report on ageing in Singapore. Between now and 2030, Singapore will witness an unprecedented profound age shift. The number of residents aged 65 years and over will multiply threefold from 300,000 to 900,000. By then, one out of every five residents will be a senior. Many of you have seen that. In fact, I've been talking and I've been looking at this report for many, many years. And you know, I've been in the social service too and, and, and we've been looking at this report even years ago. But what's scary for me now as I look at the report again is that it's only seven years away. <laughs> it's only seven years away. So the question that I always ask myself when I look at this is this. Is this going to be one of the biggest problems that we have? Or is this going to be one of the biggest potential of resource, rejuvenation, and revival the church and this nation needs today? Listen carefully. This is a question I ask myself, and I think all of us can ask ourselves too. Is this going to be the biggest problem? Or is this going to be the biggest potential? I know Cedar among us and you and I, we are of that generation. We call ourselves, actually some people call us the boomer generation. Do you know that the boomer generation is so large, okay, that wherever we are located, you will influence society, whether for good or for bad. Think about it. That is why I, I've been so excited about the fact that we are in that generation. And that's why when God says we must fulfill His purpose, the reason for us feeling purpose is not for our own sake, honestly. It's when we fulfill God's purpose in our generation, we are actually influencing all the generations before us, even around us. And that's our part. So, I believe there is a calling on this generation to make a difference. There's a calling on this generation to make a difference. Turn to the person beside you and say, there's a calling. You can make a difference. You see, we can be the change we want to see. And how this generation behaves, in that sense, how this generation responds, how this generation moves in society, whether in, society, in the church or in society, will actually make a difference on all come, on the outcomes of life. So at the start of this year, 2023, just about near the end of the year, uh, at the beginning of this year, the Lord led me to Matthew 25 as a word for this year. And, and basically the word surrounds this whole thing about that we are entering, in one sense, a destiny moment. We're entering a destiny moment. And this, this year, 2023, there are things that are going to happen. And actually, if I start looking back and recounting all the things that have happened since the start of this year, I do believe you and I can recognize that there are destiny moments that have implication and impact both in our nation 
and even around the world. And so when the Lord led me there, I, I, I realized that there is going to be like, in one sense, a need for an awakening. The word was really awakening. And if you look at Matthew 25 and you go back, some of you want to go back and read Matthew 25, you know that it consists of three big stories. The first story is about the ten virgins and, and, and it is a check-in on our spirit. And then the second story is about the talents. And I believe God wants to challenge our stewardship. Right? And most of all, finally, it's also a check-in on our service, on our giving. And I believe this is like a mini checklist about what it makes, what it takes of us to enter into this destiny moment that God is bringing us both as a church and as a nation too. In fact, if you, if you recall again, the, the things that happened this year, I mean, I really, really cannot help but realize that, yes, God, this is a destiny year for many of us. Not that it, 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 it kills us or it frames us, but it sets in place things that are going to happen even in the years ahead. That's why we need to keep an eye on Matthew 25. But the key verse that then got to me was really verse 13. Therefore, keep watch, because you do not know the day or the hour. You know, as I tell people in my generation, or in your, our generation now, when I read the Bible now, quite different. Though. When I look at the word in the last days, or when I read words like, you know, uh, you do not know the day or the hour, I know it's not just talking about the second coming. <laughs> it is talking about us. It is about a generation that actually is in that. And you and I can admit it, that when you enter this season, you somehow or other feel and know that you are in that moment where, right, you do not know the day or the hour. <laughs> but what's interesting about this verse is this. I say, Lord, why are you, when you say, if I do not know the day or the hour, then what, what do you want me to do? He says, therefore, keep watch. Now, you look at the contradiction of these two terms, okay? On one side, you do not know the day or the hour. On the other side, Jesus says, keep watch. So I say, Lord, you know, if I do not know the day or the hour, then what am I supposed to keep watch over? Okay, All right. So, 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 so I asked then myself the question: Then what else do I know? Okay, because if I know these things, then I better keep watch over it, right? God says, "Don't look at what the time or the hour, but keep watch over what we do know." So let me share with you a few things that I think I know, and I think you know too. Okay, and the first thing is this. The first thing I know is that God has placed us here for a purpose. God has placed each one of us here for a reason and a purpose. Acts 17, 26 tells us this. For one man, he made every nation of men that they should inhabit the whole earth. And he determined the time set for them in the exact place where they should live. God did this so that men would seek him, perhaps reach out to him and find him, though he is not far from each one of us. Brothers and sisters, what I know is this. God placed me here. God put me here and He determined the exact place and the exact time where you and I are to live. What it means is simply this. That means God did not just determine who you are by your birth. God determined where you are. And the very place that God has put you is an event, a divine location and a divine part of His divine plan. Therefore, therefore, what is very clear to me is this. The very destiny of who I am and what I am before God is intricately entwined with the destiny of the land where He has given me birth. Listen there, carefully. The destiny of who and what I am before God is intricately entwined with the destiny of the land of which you were given birth and live. This is our real destination, in a sense. And just in case you have never noticed, destination is made up of two words, destiny and nation. That's why I believe our destiny is entwined with the destiny of this nation. 
So therefore, as fellow sojourners on this journey, I want to encourage you, especially many of us who are in this season of life. Some call it the autumn season. I know because it's before winter, okay? Right? But we are in a very unique season. But what I do know is this, that whether you're in autumn season, summer or spring, God has a unique purpose and design for you in that season. And the mark that we are heading for is really when God says to us, we have fulfilled His purpose in our generation. Now, here's where I call the, the Bible double confirms it, okay? <laughs> right? right? And the double confirmation you find is found in Jeremiah 29, verse 11. What does it say? For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans to prosper you and not to harm you. Plans to give you a future and a hope. Many of us, any of us say, Amen, 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 do that, right? Okay? And many of us probably memorize it over and over. Can you say it backwards? Okay? Right? But do you know that five few verses before that perfect plan, before that intentional perfect plan of God, is Jeremiah 29 verse 7 that says this what? Right? Seek the peace and prosperity of the city to which I have carried you in the exile. Pray to the Lord for it, Paul, because if it prospers, you will prosper too. Friends, what more confirmation do you and I need? Where God has placed you, where God even has exiled you. You know, in Jeremiah 29, it's about a people in exile, no? It was about people who actually would be grumbling about, God, why did you put me here? Why did you put me here? Somebody go throw me there. But even in that kind of a place, God says what? Pray for it. Pray for it because if it prospers, you will prosper too. Again, where God has placed us, where we live, the destiny of the land, your destiny, my destiny, is intricately entwined. So brothers and sisters, at the core of living a life of purpose is really having a heart and love for this nation. Having a heart and love for the nation that God has given to you. Let me tell you, I'm not doing this as a patriotic thing or neither is it PAP sponsored, okay? <laughs> this is a God thing. Having a love for the nation and the place that God has given you is a God thing. And when God says to me, when the, the Word of God says to me, therefore keep watch, this is what I'm watching for. This is what I'm watching for. This makes the difference, in one sense, when we enter and embrace this autumn season. In one sense, it is not just about ourselves. It is about us fulfilling our purpose in our generation for the call of God for this nation. And if this nation's destiny is at stake, the, word, the question is this, can we be counted on to make a difference to the destiny of this land? Can you and I, our generation, our senior generation, elder generation, whatever you call it, the Caleb generation, be counted on to make a difference to the destiny of the land? Will we fulfill God's purposes? Remember, I believe there is a calling on this generation to make a difference. There is a calling on this generation to make a difference. So allow me to then now quickly share with you three helping hands in one sense that we can give that can help shape the destiny of this land, that can help turn the destiny of Singapore Godward. They are, number one, a hand of prayer. Number two, a hand of service. Next slide. Okay. And number three, a hand of healing. A hand of prayer, right, that moves the heart of God. Okay. A hand of service, right, that mirrors the heart of God and a healing hand that ministers the heart of God. I believe our generation has that unique call. 
in each of this, in our hand, putting our hands to it, we can shape and make a difference to the destiny of our nation. So let's start with the one one. A praying hand that moves the heart of God. That must be our priority. Second Chronicles 7, 14. Many of you know this verse. If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and I will forgive their sin and will heal their land. Regardless of whatever age we're in, we all know this call to prayer too well. And when God's people cry out in unity, repent and seek His face, God will hear from heaven and heal our land. And we know nothing happens without prayer, but we also know that the greatest problem with prayer is prayer, okay? Why then do we not pray? Why then do we not pray? Well, I find it is still worth repeating two big reasons why we do not pray. Number one, a false sense of sufficiency. Number two, a lack of intimacy with the Father. You see, as a nation, as a generation, we've grown up very, truly blessed, okay? I call myself, in one sense, an overblessed generation, or overblessed in, in Singapore. And we've grown accustomed, we've grown accustomed to our abilities and the provisions that so easily surround us. That sense of sufficiency with whatever we do, you know, we, we forget that we actually started with nothing. And the more we do not pray and neglect prayer, it leads us further to that false sense of sufficiency, right? which then moves us even further from our dependency on God. It is actually quite a vicious cycle, do you know that? It is a vicious cycle with our relationship gets colder and we move further away from God. In fact, in Revelation 2.5, it says this, Consider how far you have fallen. Repent and do the things you did at first. If you do not repent, I will come to you and remove your lampstand from its place. You know, that means really this, that God may remove even our call and our anointing and our purpose that He has given to us. So don't fall away. Don't let prayer. Well, this last National Day season, last August, I'm sure many of you would have sensed too that there was a wake-up call to pray for our land. In particular, to pray for the leaders of our land. Many of you know that in Singapore, we have gone through, I think, or we're still going through some difficult and challenging times. In fact, I believe the Holy Spirit is just nudging us not just to pray, but what should we pray? 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 1 to 4. I urge you then, first of all, that petitions, prayer, intercession, and thanksgiving be made for all people, for kings and all those in authority, that we may live peacefully and quiet lives in all godliness, holiness, and this is good and pleases God, our Saviour, who wants all people to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. I believe God is stirring us up into a new season of praying for the leaders and all in authority. And I feel that there's an urgency and there's a burden to do it. Because many of us know that there is truly a vulnerability and an exposure that comes with leadership. That's why my call is this, that we should start repenting first from not praying, and then we should recommit ourselves to praying seriously again for our leaders. And when I talk about leaders, I don't just mean government leaders. I mean leaders of the land. Pray for your senior pastor. I'm glad to, to be here with, with, with Pastor Jeff on his birthday. You're praying for him. It is important for us to pray. You know why? I don't know whether you notice this. In 1 Timothy 2, verse 3 and verse 4, we just read, this is good and pleases God, our Saviour, who wants all people to be saved. You know, this is a key to revival, you know. This is a key to seeing revival coming even to our land when we start praying for our leaders. Because you see, when leaders fall, it hurts and it's painful for so many people in society and all. And, and I sense God reminding us that we need to pray for our leaders. And what do we pray for? Recently at the day of His power, 
when I led this section of prayer, I said to the people, I know what exactly what God wants us to pray for. Is to pray for families. To pray for families, pray for families to be, to, be, to be strong, families to be protected, and families to be valued. Now let me just share why I think it's such a special call for us as our generation. I believe that as a generation, as a senior generation, our prayers, in one sense, have great potential and it's probably one of the most untapped power right, around. Think about that. The prayer of fathers over their children makes all the difference, right? But I tell you, lately I've been very excited. The prayer of grandfathers and grandmothers <laughs> make even bigger difference. And when you and I are in this generation starting to pray for our leaders, you know why? Many of you know that our leaders are probably all younger than you and I. And God has somehow given us that privilege to do that. And I know that when I pray for the leaders now, I don't pray for a position of saying, you know, well, you know, you're like that, serve me on way. No, no, no. I pray because I say, I know what it's like to be a leader. I know of the vulnerabilities. I know of the challenges. I know of the concerns. I know of the, I mean, I know of the burdens. I know of the loneliness. I know of all these things. Because I was a leader once. But God now brings me to this autumn gener- uh, season. And my role is different. My call is different. And my prayers are different. And I believe, for example, when my wife and myself, we pray for our grandchildren. We pray with a certain renewed passion, authority, and belief. And God has given us that privilege. In one sense, you know, brothers and sisters, no one can do that, no, except you. Think about it. Right? No one can do that except you. Why? Because of our age. You know? But that's why there's a unique call. With age comes a sense of sobriety in that sense. With age comes, I realize now whenever people come to me, uh, some of the leaders come to me a lot of problems here and there, I, I do a lot of this kind of mentoring. I realize now that my answers are a little bit more mellow, a little bit more steady. I, I, I don't tell them, hey, you need to chong this and chong that. Or make sure you secure this, uh, you know, cover this base, cover that. No, no, no. I begin to tell them, say things like, hey, don't forget, uh, God is our dependency. Don't forget, uh, our Holy Spirit can really be your guide. Don't forget, uh, hey, at the end of the day, your family is more important than all that you need to do. You get what I mean? I, I find that the kind of things that I pray for, the things that I, 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 I ask them to do, or the things that I coach, is a whole different in spirit. And I believe God has called our generation to do that. We are in a place of what I call empathy and understanding. That unique role. And that's why to the seniors, I say to you, join me, okay, as I believe that God has called us in this generation, our generation, in this season, to be encouragers, to be supporters, and to be intercessors. These are our three key roles. You notice I took out leader, okay, right? And it's intentional. I believe God wants us to do that when we pray for our leaders. Remember Psalm 127, verse 1 that says, Unless the Lord builds the house, the builders labor in vain. Unless the Lord watches over the city, the city, the guards stand watch in vain. That's why when we pray, when this generation prays, there is going to be a difference. There is going to be a difference. So the first thing that we can do to make a difference, number one, We can be a praying hand that moves the heart of God. But the second thing is this. We can be a serving hand that mirrors the heart of God. This must be our posture. And I believe for all of us who are called into this unique season of life, this is a very unique opportunity that God gives us to. Let me go back again to Matthew 25, okay? Many of you know that in the midst of Matthew 25, there's this story about the sheep and the goats. And Matthew 25, verse 31, 33 says this, okay? right? When the Son of Man comes in His glory and all the angels with Him, He will sit on His glorious throne. All the nations will gather before Him and He will separate the people from one another as a shepherd shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. He will put the sheep on His right and the goats on His left. Brothers and sisters, I want to tell you that this is what I call a destiny moment. 
A destiny moment where we come before the throne of God in those last days, in that final day, and as nations gather before Him, He's going to say, you are a sheep nation and you are a goat nation. And the destiny of the nations are fallen at that moment. In that final day, it's going to be just sheep and goats, okay? And God sits on His throne and He separates them. What then makes the difference? What makes the difference between the sheep and the goats? Let's go down to verse 37 and verse 40. Then the righteous will answer him, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you or thirsty and give you something to drink? When did we see you a stranger invite you in or needing clothes and clothe you? When did we see you sick or in prison and go to visit you? The king will reply, Truly I tell you, whatever you did for one of the least brothers of mine, sisters of mine, you did for me. And then in verse 45 and verse 46 it says, He will reply, Truly I tell you, whatever you did not do for one of the least of these, you did not do for me then you will go into eternal punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. This, brothers and sisters, makes all the difference. What you did or did not do. What you did or did not do. So to borrow a phrase from one of my favourite Star Wars characters, okay, Mr Yoda, he says this, okay, do or do not, there is no try. What he's trying to say is this, okay? You either do or don't do. You cannot have half do, half not, half do, half this, no, no. You either do or did not do. But you know, when I look at this judgment call again, and as I look closely to it, the Lord began to show me something deeper than just do or did not do. And if you look carefully at this, there are four last words in that statement that says, to the least of these. What is the point? The point is really this. And what's the revelation to me? The point is that, are we ready and willing, even in this season of our life, to influence the destiny of this nation and to ask hard and difficult questions like, are we serving and are we doing to the least of these? Let me tell you why it's a difficult one. It's a difficult question because you know why? It's talking about the poor of the poor. The poorest of the poor. It's talking about the less visible cases that nobody likes. It's talking about the most complicated cases, maybe even probably the last and the least of all the poor. And this is not an easy question, especially for us leaders and even in ministry. right? Because in one sense, this is one of those places where I say there's very little ROI. Okay? In fact, often no ROI, no return on investment. The call of God is this are we going to the least of this? Because you see, this is what biblical social justice is all about. God wants us to, He wants us to be that, that, that hand to love the least of these. Because you see, in ministry and in all that we do, even in Singapore sometimes, I've been in social work for many, many years too. And many people like to use this term, which sometimes I I cringe over, called low-hanging fruits. Which basically means this, uh, let's take the easy way out first. Let's take the easy way out first, so that we are are, are okay and being clear of our conscience. At least we answer the do part uh, and the do not do part. But are we willing to be challenged to consider, have we gone to the least of these. Let me tell you why. Let me tell you why. Because this is a destiny question. It is a question when we face the, 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 the maker and the nations come before him, is the nations a sheep nation or a goat nation? And that's why included in this will be world missions. Included in this will be the unreached people groups. Included in this will be nations that have never had an opportunity to experience the blessing that we have even in Singapore. So today, I want to be a bit intentional. I want to not let this occasion go by without intentionally pointing out at least one of these groups in our society that is among the least of these and close to the heart of God. And that is our brothers and sisters and friends and fellow citizens with special needs. Persons differently able, physically and intellectually. You see, there's a 
NVPC publication, which stands for the National Volunteer and Philanthropy Center, that says this, people with disabilities still face social exclusion and stigma. And then another survey from another organization says this, that about 62% of people with disabilities, okay, right, do not feel they are included, accepted, given opportunities to contribute or reach their potential by society. And what's worse, another finding in another survey says this, 64% of the public surveyed are willing to share public spaces but not interact with people with special needs. Brothers and sisters, there's a group out there that I believe is on God's heart that is in the least of these. And I believe we need to start thinking about them as a church even. Because you see, this is going to be a growing issue and it's going to be a great need. And with the aging population, right, this, this, the concerns of the persons without, with disabilities in our society will be amplified and multiplied and even compounded, okay? From the person with disabilities and for especially even for their caregivers. Which therefore leads us to a second question. Who is even concerned and taking care of the caregivers? Because you see, 60% of all caregivers in Singapore, right, that care for the elderly and disabled are above 40 years old, and 10% are 60 years or 69 years old and above. I want to share with you a dream that has always been on my heart for many years already. And whenever I have an opportunity, I believe God wants me to just declare this and share this so that together, maybe one day, God can see this dream come about. And my belief is this, my dream is this, that one day the church of Jesus Christ in Singapore, when called upon, will be able to stand up, step forward, and support persons with disabilities all the way until their end of life. And don't leave it and depend on just government agencies. When they have no one else left, when society ages, where they have no more families, no more children, no more cares, even our persons with special needs will become aging. And who will care for them? And I know that even for myself, I may not even be around. I believe the solution is not in a person. The solution is in a body. And when the body of Christ, the body of church stands up and be counted, I believe there's going to be a unique place for us to play so that anyone out there with special needs in their family can turn to the church and the church can be that one place that they can count on that will serve their children's needs or their disability needs even up to the end. Even up to the place where none of us will be around. It takes the body. I know we cannot do it alone. We need the body to do this. And that's why I believe our generation, this senior generation, I know many of you here are accomplished professionals, uh, 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 maybe financial professionals, lawyers, legal people, and, uh, and all those things. God made you that unique way. I think we can contribute to this. And I think our generation must be that generation. That's why I believe I'm going to be that thorn in the flesh that will continue to make it. I know I can't make it happen by myself. I'll just declare this and keep on saying, can the church stand up and do this together? So that there's a place where we showcase and we mirror the heart of God for the least of these. Can you and I do that? Again, I'm doing this or I'm sharing this because I believe this is a destiny question. Can you and I shape and influence the destiny of this nation? Can you and I, as a generation, impact the destiny of this nation? This is the call that God wants to give to us. How can we shape the destiny of our land? Number one, we need to be the praying hand that moves the heart of God. Number two, we need to be the serving hand that mirrors the heart of God. And finally, we need to be that healing hand that ministers the heart of God. That must be our passion. That must be our passion. You see, finally, more than ever before, we live in a much divided world and a very polarized world. 
People take sides, okay? Even just for the sake of taking sides, okay? We live in a volatile, uncertain, complex, and ambiguous world. Many of us know we live in this world, what they call VUCA. Many feeling hopelessness and even without meaning. That's why many of us are facing much of these mental health issues we're seeing not just in Singapore, but around the world today. That lack of sense of purpose and destiny. That's why more than ever before, we are living in a time where there's a great need for healing, there's a great need for reconciliation, and there's a great need for restoration. Someone once said this, that we are probably living in the worst of times, but it can also be the best of times. In fact, Jesus made it clear that you and I will have trouble. In John 16, verse 33, he says this, I've told you these things so that you and me may have peace. In this world, you will have trouble. Not maybe, not will be, or should be. You will have troubles. But take heart, I've overcome the world. That's why Jesus is the only solution that can make this, in one sense, happen again. The healing, the reconciliation, and the rest of you. That's why we must go back to basics again. We must go back to basics as to why does the Lord lead us, leave us here on this earth? You know, many of you have probably heard this before, right? Or the day you accepted Jesus Christ, you know, into your life. Because of that, you could have this, top, go to heaven, right? That's what it is. But no, the Lord left us here for a reason and for a purpose. And lately, when I started thinking about this message more and more, I said, you know, in one sense, the longer you live, the more life God gives to you, He actually is depositing more things in you for you to bless. In one sense, the, your, your, your length of years even is like the ten talents or the five talents. For some, it will be five. For some, it will be the length of years. Because you see, it is in our life and our lived experiences that we can come back and contribute to the purposes of God. God has a purpose. God has an intention giving us life on this earth. Here and here even as the citizens of Singapore. Why are we here? Let me go back to basics again. 2 Corinthians 5, 17 to 20. What does it say? It says this, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he's a new creation. The old has gone, the new has come. All this is from God who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. Brothers and sisters, I want to bring us back again to this thing, that your most basic call when God saved you and God brought you into his kingdom is to give you and I that ministry of reconciliation. You know, I, I, I kind of realize that this has not been taught enough. We talk so much about the Great Commission versus the Ministry of Reconciliation. Because you see, in the Great Commission, sometimes I think we receive what I call combat ops orders. But in the Ministry of Reconciliation, it is a ministry call to go forth. Then Paul goes on to say in verse 19, that God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting men's sin against them, and he has committed us to the message of reconciliation. You see, the key in sharing the gospel, yes, I know many of us say it's the good news, it's the good news, it's the good news, but do you know that the good news is really about the message of reconciliation? And I think sometimes, Sometimes, and I am one also to be blamed. I've been in the ministry long enough. I've been in the church long enough to realize that sometimes we share the gospel not from a message of reconciliation. We say, good to have, good to have. You know, you, you, know, you, can, you can go to heaven after you die, that kind of thing. But we miss getting the real message across. And that is that God is reconciling himself to us and we to him through Jesus Christ. The message of reconciliation. And then he goes on. Look at verse 20. It says this, We are therefore Christ's ambassadors, as though God was making His appeal through us. We implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. I'm sure by now you're getting the sense of where I'm coming from, okay? I think this is a big miss for the church even today. 
I believe that we have, in one sense, gone really strong. And, 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 and don't get me wrong, okay, pastors and leaders. I'm not here to say that the Great Commission is wrong. I'm just saying here that the Ministry of Reconciliation is more urgent even today. Because on one side, we give a command. On the other side, we give an appeal. Because you see, we forget, you know, that we are first ambassadors. We are not messengers, we are not Christ salesmen, okay? Trying to make a sales pitch and trying to close a deal. There's something very special, there's something very unique and even dignified about being an ambassador. Think about it. Do you know that when you look up ambassador in the dictionary, it says this, you know, that it is actually the highest ranking representative of a nation. Think about it. God made you an ambassador the moment you came to Christ and you are the highest ranking person of His kingdom that He's sending out to represent Him. I tell you, that's a big difference for me. You know, and, 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 as opposed to soldiers ordered to go out. I want to appeal to you. And that's why the word that, that Paul uses to appeal. I believe there's an urgency, maybe even an emergency for this ministry of reconciliation to be fully activated. There's not just an urgency, but there's an emergency for this ministry of reconciliation to be fully activated. You see, the reconciliation and healing mode is very different from the combative and confrontation mode. Right at the onset of Jesus' ministry in His Sermon on the Mount, it was a simple, clear mandate that he gives to the kingdom of God. Matthew 5, 9 says this, Blessed are the peacemakers. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. Lately, I've been challenged to read this verse again, over and over again. And I was reminded that Jesus did not say, you are going to be a peacekeeper, Jesus did not say that you're going to be a peace maintainer. Those are good. But his point is this, you are to be a peacemaker. I want to suggest to you that what Jesus was trying to tell us that there was an active, proactive, intentional, and even creative effort on our part to go out and make peace. Think about that. God is calling us to be peace makers, to go out and make peace. And I think you hear me throughout this message saying over and over again that there's something about the age that God brings us into. This generation that we have this privilege to be part of, I believe this call is something unique and special for our senior generation our elder generation, because I think you can step out and be that peacemaker and people will want to listen to you. I begin to realize now that that's some of the role that I can play. When I hear of conflicting views and all, because of my seniority, not in rank, just purely by age and experience and life, I can step in and say, guys, listen, okay, is this what you're saying? And this is what you're saying. Actually, both of you are saying the same thing. And I'm glad both of you are listening to me, <laughs> okay, in that sense. And when you listen to me, I can tell you that this is what you can do. And I begin to realize that I have that role, and I can play that role to be that peacemaker. So, so brothers and sisters, I'm excited to share with you this morning because I'm so excited to know that today I'm going to see 250, 300 more peacemakers, okay, going out there into the community because we are in that kind of a time. The boomer generation, I believe, has this unique call to fulfill God's purpose as peacemakers. Not by qualification, not by the skills you possess, just by even your age alone. I'm sure many of you know your grandfathers, or you can remember your grandfathers or your own fathers and all. They might not be as qualified as many of you too, but when they step into the room or when they step into the family, at least the family says, okay, Grandpa, I want to listen to you. Tell me what you feel and what you think. 
And when we play that role, wow, I think there's something going to be special. The ministry of reconciliation can be activated again. And that's God's call. That's God's call for us. I want to share with you a few pointers that, 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 that help me frame and reframe this whole understanding of the ministry of reconciliation. Let me start with this. A ministry of reconciliation begins with a ministry of restoration and not restitution or confrontation. A ministry of reconciliation begins with a ministry of restoration and not restitution and confrontation. Let me tell you why I came to this. I can still remember my younger days as a leader and even a leader in church. And I now look back and I cringe and I say, God, forgive me and I repent. <laughs> because there were days where, you know, the, uh, 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 young church leaders or uh, Christians come to us and, and share with us some of the pains that they go through and some of the confessions that they had to make uh, about the things that they felt before God. And I had to oh, you must confess, you know. You must know exactly what you're confessing about. You must know who you're sorry to. And then you must go to the people that, uh, you know, I, wow. And, and we started making it such a deal about these things without recognizing that actually the first step is restoration. And I think the church is so guilty and so painful. I've done that so much. And I myself am guilty. And I begin to say, God, what if I had just began thinking restoration? And I think the whole ministry, the whole atmosphere of how we do even ministry can change. Because when we start thinking restoration, Okay, we then begin to realize that this is where uh, we are getting into. First thing, then secondly, the ministry of healing often begins with the ministry of presence. You see, with presence comes the healing of acceptance, empathy, and what it basically says this is that I am with you and I understand. A willingness through our presence to be identified and to be unashamed to be with the sinners and difficult people and even with the outcasts of societies, the ex-offenders. It's not words, not even material needs. Just your presence alone can bring healing to them. And I find myself reminded of this many a times when I go out there into the community, when I'm dealing with people in one sense who are very different from me. I say to them, hey, I, I, I don't mind taking a picture with you. Would you like to take a picture with me? You know, that kind of thing. I offer myself to them because you know why? I feel like if they are able to even feel that like I stand with them, I'm not ashamed to stand with them. It is just by your presence. I'm not saying qualification. I'm not even saying of the training classes that you've done. Just by your presence, the ministry of healing comes up. Jesus used two very powerful, simple words to describe this. Salt and light. We are called to be salt of the earth. Matthew 5.13 says this, what? you are the salt of the earth. Then we are called to be the light. Matthew 5.14-16 uh, uh, says, you are the light of the world. Friends and sisters, many of you would probably have heard this again, over and over again. For salt and light to work, what must happen? Salt first must be in contact. You cannot salt anything by being away. Right? You cannot cook a dish and put your salt out there and everybody uh, enjoy their food. No. Salt must be added. And when salt is added, salt is in contact, it makes all the difference. And that's where you and I have a part. I believe as senior generation, we have opportunities to get in touch, to get in contact. Then where does light work? Well, light doesn't work in a bright place like this. Light only works often, and often is most useful when things are dark. And that's why we need to go to this. Let your light shine. You know, there's someone who said this. If half of us are just a little bit more willing to let the people around us know that we are followers of Jesus, we're going to have a lot more people asking to bring them to church. If half of us are just a little bit more willing to tell people around us, know that we are followers of Jesus, you're going to have a lot more people asking you to bring them to church. You see, I believe with age comes that unique privilege 
I'm sure many of you know, right? You can sit in front of a whole group of young people and tell them, hey, this uncle here, you know, I believe God really provided for all my needs. And they can see your life. They can see where you come from. And you can be unashamed to share with them that. Because you have reached a new season of your life where you don't have to like hide, protect my position, uh, my brand, uh, and all these things. That's something you and I can give and bring and make a difference. So let your light shine. So in closing, how does we, our generation, make a difference? As I shared with you, we can do three things. We can offer our nation three hands. First, the praying hand, then the serving hand, and finally, the healing hand that ministers the heart of God. I want to share with you something that happened just a few weeks back. In fact, it happened on August 9th, okay, our national day. Because my wife and myself were blessed with a pair of tickets to be at the Padang. We were down at the Padang and we were there at the parade. That's something that I do look forward to because for many, many years, I, we would usually go down to the parade at a time because I used to be very involved with the NDP parade. We were part of the, as you know, the touch motivators and all. We've established a certain culture in that place and all. And, and so I get the opportunity to be there at most of these parades. And so, so I was looking forward to going back again because after many years of not being involved and all, and I, I said, wow, well, oh, it's nice that we got there. And I always remember the, the exciting things that were done and the, and the excitement of the moment and the atmosphere. And, and I can remember those years where, 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 when the parade ended and everything else. Wow, there was so much uh, uh, high. The energy was just there. And everybody was just so excited to be Singaporeans again. Well, this year when I went in 2023, the theme was a very good theme. It says, Onward as One. In fact, the theme song was even very more exciting and, and, and some people even say that the theme song is like a, a mega church worship song. Okay? It says, uh, shine your light, shine your light, okay? Shine your light upon the world, shine a light for everyone. Go shine your light into the world, shine your light, make it bright. Everybody sing, you know, shine your light. You know, we could use that as, as be a chorus for, 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 for worship even here. It's a call for us to go out and shine your light. But you know, at the end of the parade, when I stood up to go, I somehow had a sad feeling come upon me. There was a feeling of sadness. And I don't know why, but I was just standing up, walking towards getting out to the road, and I look up, and I saw even the, the stage where all the VIPs and ministers are all so suddenly disappeared. That means the moment the president left, everybody left. I said, what happened? Last time we would just linger around, want to soak in the atmosphere, you know. You know, I, I, I said, God, there was a lingering spirit of sadness that came on me. And then I realized that I'm not the only one. I, I read the papers after that. Even our president, Halima Yaakob, was quoted as saying, there was an immense sense of sadness and inspiration at the same time, okay? Right? I, 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 I didn't quite get to her to ask her what she meant by that. But I think suddenly there was like, everybody was just waiting to go home and gone. And then just at that moment when I was looking down at the, 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 the people there, you know, there was this voice that came into my head, okay? I like to think it was the Holy Spirit, okay? And the voice said this, if it is a God thing, let's move out of the spectator stand into the playing field. If it is a God thing, let's move out of the spectator stand into the playing field. Now, many of you know it was Pastor Jeff, okay? <laughs> right? I'm not doing this as a sponsor and advertisement for him, okay? <laughs> it was really true. And the reason was this. As I look out at the stage there, and I begin to see the people that were participating in the parade, they were really excited. But everybody that was in the stands was too, too quiet. There was that no sense of involvement. And immediately, I felt the Lord give me this message. He says, for Singapore to fulfill its destiny, the people of God, the body of Christ, the seniors and the elder generation will need to step out, 
Step up and step in to the playing field. That is the call of God for us. It is not just because Pastor Jeff said it at the last day of the 40-day season. As I said to you, is loving this nation just a patriotic thing? I believe it is a God thing. And therefore, if it is a God thing, then God is calling each one of us, whatever age that you're in, more so for those of us in this boomer generation, to get out of our seats and to get into the playing field. In fact, a few of us in this boomer generation has been wanting to get together uh, friends, a few friends that say, let's write a book. Okay? And the title of the book is this one, no? Boomers, get out of your chair. <laughs> okay? right. the, the, and I think it's right. We need to fulfill God's purpose for our generation and not for ourselves, but for the sake of the destiny of this nation. So the only way I could end the service is to go back to my simple Sunday school song that says, This little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine. This little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine. And I'm going to invite you. I'm going to invite you today to get out of your seat. To get out of your seat and to say to the Lord, Lord, whatever place I'm in, Whatever season I'm in, let your light shine to me. That is the message that God wants to speak to us as a generation first. Yes, it is for the church too, but I believe in particular for our generation here. In fact, as I was worshipping just now, I had this prompting. It says, you know, many of us may not have responded to altar calls for many, many years already. Because we are that senior group, right? You've been in church, uh, you know. Oh, everybody already here. Well, today I told Pastor Jeff and I told the worship team, today's altar call is simply this. Everyone get out of the seat. We are going to make a prophetic act that we will get out of the seat where we are. Do whatever place, okay? That's enough. I, I'm so happy we are in the Exodus Auditorium. Okay? That means we've got a whole place, okay? Just get out of your seat. Stand in the altar. Stand by the aisle and all as a prophetic act to say, God, count on me. My generation, I want to make a difference for you. I know I'm in the last days. I know my baby in the times where, 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 where next day I, I might be gone. But I want to fulfill God's purpose. Whatever age you are. And Pastor Jeff said to me, give them a bit, give them a bit of time to, to come forward. I said, yeah, yeah, yeah. We'll give them some time to come forward. It's okay. We have time. We just want to do this one thing today. Everyone out of our seat as a commitment to the Lord and say, this generation will want to be called upon to make a difference for the destiny of our land. Would you stand? This little light of mine I'm gonna let it shine this little light of mine I'm gonna let it shine Come forth, come out, come out of your seats This little light of mine Just get out of your chair It is a symbol, it is a prophetic act to the Lord As a generation, we want to be counted for God This little light of mine This little light of mine Come forward, come forward, come forward I'm gonna let it shine This little light of mine I'm gonna let it shine There's enough space out here, come forward This little light of mine I'm gonna let it shine Let it shine Let it shine Let it shine One more time, this little light of mine this little light of mine You come, you come, we're gonna give you time I'm gonna let it shine This little light of mine I'm gonna let it shine This little light of mine I'm gonna let it shine Let it shine, let it shine Let it shine Everywhere I go I go, I'm gonna let it shine. 
take us all to just we'll close our eyes and lift our hands to the Lord. I'm going to pray for you right now. But before I pray for you, I know the Lord is already beginning to put in your mind and in your heart even faces of people, even places that you're going to go to. I know God is going to stir up a new generation, a new, so-called new older generation that will be excited, standing up for Him. Making a difference by just being an encourager. Making a difference by just being a supporter. Making a difference by just being an intercessor. Because those are crucial roles that this nation needs in this season. There's crucial roles that the church needs in this time. And we need a generation that is united, a generation that is of one heart, a generation that is together, that will go for God's purposes and for God's reason. So as you lift your hands, close your eyes, let the Holy Spirit begin to speak to you. Let the Holy Spirit begin to show you. And basically it means simply this. Turn on your torchlight. Turn on the light that God has already put in you. Father, we want to thank you for this moment. I know that you are here and that you are going to let your light shine. You are going to allow a generation that will make a difference, not just for themselves, but a difference for the destiny of this nation. That this nation will turn Godward because you have raised a generation that wants to fulfill its purposes for God and for all eternity. So Lord, bless my brothers and sisters as you see these hands that are lifted up. Lord, they are hands of surrender to you. We, yes, do not know the time or the hour, but you have told us to keep watch. And I pray that this generation will keep watch and be in prayer and believe you for all that God has given to us and all that God wants to do for our nation and for this nation. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. 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 Let your light shine. Let's do it one more. I'll be timing it out. Let it go. This little light of mine, I'm gonna let it shine. This little light of mine, I'm gonna let it shine. Turn to your neighbor and say to one another, I'm gonna let it shine. I'm gonna let it shine.